This is Carol Goodman. My book is called The Night Visitors. Alice gets off a bus in the middle of a snowstorm in Delphi, New York. She is fleeing an abusive relationship and desperate to protect Warren, 10 years old, a major Star Wars fan, and wise beyond his years. Though Alice is wary, Warren bonds nearly instantly with Maddie, a social worker in her 50s who lives in an enormous, rundown house in the middle of the woods. Maddie lives alone and is always available, so she is the person the hotline always calls when someone needs a late-night pickup. And although, according to protocol, Maddie should take Alice and Orrin to the local shelter, instead, she brings them home for the night. She has plenty of room, she says. What she doesn't say is that Orrin reminds her of her little brother, who died almost 35 years ago at the age of 10. But Maddie isn't the only one withholding elements of the truth. Alice is keeping her own secrets. And as the snowstorm worsens around them, each woman's past will prove itself unburied, stirring up threats both within and without. Book lovers unite. I'm Demetheus Jackson, and you're listening to the Chapter One Podcast. The greatest stories ever written all begin with chapter one. And each episode, our guest authors will share their first chapters with you. Hey, everybody. On today's episode, I'm going to be speaking with Carol Goodman, the author of Night Visitor, which is a suspense mystery story, but I would even classify it as a psychological thriller. And the story behind her writing of this book is just as interesting as the book itself because this book is about the effects of domestic violence. And it not only explores the trauma of those experiences, but also the results of what happens when you place a domestic abuse victim with secrets, a slightly emotionally damaged social worker, and a kid with too much smarts for his age in the middle of a snowstorm. Sounds intriguing? Carol Goodman, Night Visitor, starts right now. Chapter One, Alice. Orrin falls asleep at last on the third bus. He's been fighting it since Newburgh, eyelids heavy as wet laundry, pried up again and again by sheer stubbornness. Finally, I think, when he nods off, if I have to answer one more of his questions, I might lose it. Where are we going? He asked on the first bus. Something safe, I answered. He had stared at me. Even in the darkened bus, his eyes shining with too much smart for his age, and then looked away as if embarrassed for me. An hour later, he'd asked, as if there hadn't been miles of highway in between, where is it safe? There are places I'd begun, as if telling him a bedtime story, but then I had to rack my brain for what came next. All I could picture were candy houses and chicken-legged huts that hid witches. Those weren't the stories he liked best anyway. He preferred the book of myths from the library. It's still in his pack, racking up fines with every mile, about heroes who wrestle lions and behead snake-haired monsters. There are places, I began again, trying to remember something from the book. Remember when Orestes flees the Furies and he goes to some temple so the Furies can't hurt him there? It was the temple of Apollo at Delphi, Oren said, and it's called a sanctuary. No one likes a smarty pants, I'd countered. Since he found that mythology book, he likes to show off how well he's learned all those Greek names. He'd liked Orestes right away because their names were alike. I'd tried to read around the parts that weren't really for kids, but he always knew if I skipped over something, and later I saw him reading the story to himself, staring at the picture of the Furies with their snake hair and bat wings. The next bus stop, he found the flyer for the hotline. It was called Sanctuary, as if Orrin saying the word had made it appear. I gave him a handful of change to buy a candy bar while I made the call. I didn't want him to hear the story I'd have to tell. But even with him across the waiting room, standing at the snacks counter, his shoulders hunched under the weight of his Star Wars backpack, he looked like he was listening. 
The woman who answered the phone started to ask about my feelings, but I cut to the chase and told her that I'd left my husband and taken my son with me. He hit me, I said, and he told me he'd kill me if I tried to leave. I have no place to go. My voice had stuttered to a choked end. Across the waiting room, Oren had turned to look at me as if he had heard me, but that was impossible. He was too far away. The woman's voice on the phone was telling me about a shelter in Kingston. Oren was walking across the waiting room. When he reached me, he said, it can't be a place anyone knows about. I rolled my eyes at him like I didn't know that. But I repeated his words into the phone anyway, trying to sound firm. The woman on the other end didn't say anything for a moment. And looking into Oren's eyes, I was suddenly more afraid than I'd been since we'd left. I understand, the woman said at last, slowly, as if she were speaking to someone who might not understand. I recognized the social worker's explaining voice and felt a prickle of anger that surprised me. I thought that I was past caring what a bunch of morally sanctimonious social workers thought about me. We can arrange for a safe house, one no one will know about, but you might have to stay tonight in the shelter. Oren shook his head as if he could hear what the woman said, or as if he already knew that I'd messed it up. It has to be tonight, I said. Again, the woman paused. In the background, a cat meowed and a kettle whistled. I pictured a comfortable, warm room, framed pictures on the walls, throw pillows on a couch, lamplight, and was suddenly swamped by so much anger I grew dizzy. Orrin reached out a hand to steady me. The woman said something, but I missed it. There was a roaring in my ears. Give me the number there, she was saying. I'll make a call and call you right back. I read her the number on the payphone and then hung up. Orrin handed me a cup of hot coffee and a donut. How had he gotten all that for a handful of change? Does he have money of his own he hasn't told me about? I slumped against the wall to wait, and Orrin leaned next to me. It will be all right, I told him. These places, they have a system. He nodded, jaw clenched. I touched his cheek and he flinched. I looked around to see if anyone had noticed, but the only other occupants of the station were a texting college student, the old woman behind the snacks counter, and a drunk passed out on a bench. When the phone rang, I nearly jumped out of my skin. I picked up the phone before it rang again. For a second, all I heard was breathing, and I had the horrible, crazy thought that it was him. But then the woman spoke in a breathless rush as if she'd run somewhere fast. Can you get the next bus for Kingston? I told you no shelp, I began, but the woman cut me off. At Kingston, you'll get a bus to Delphi. Someone will meet you there, someone you can trust. Her name's Maddie. She's in her 50s, short, silvery hair, and she'll probably be wearing something purple. She'll take you to a safe house, a place no one knows about but us. I looked down at Oren, and he nodded. Okay, I said, we'll be there on the next bus. I hung up and knelt down to tell Oren where we were going, but he was already handing me two tickets for the next bus for Kingston and two for Delphi. Look, he said, the town's got the same name as the place in the book. That was two hours and two buses ago. The last bus has taken us through steadily falling snow into mountains that loom on either side of the road. Orrin had watched the swirling snow as if it were speaking to him, as if he were the one leading us here. It's just a coincidence, I tell myself, about the name. Lots of these little upstate towns have names like that, Athens, Utica, Troy, names that make you think of palm trees and marble, not crappy little crossroads with one 7-Eleven and a tattoo parlor. I was relieved when Oren fell asleep, not just because I was tired of his questions, but because I was afraid of what I might ask him. How did you know where we were going? How the hell did you get those tickets? And what I might do to get the answer out of him. It's always interesting. So obviously when I read something, you know, I have my own voice and the personality comes through the words. But when the author reads, you can really connect with the characters. Like the personality really just comes out. Right. I I like hearing authors read their own work. I always think that then from then on, I'll hear their voice when I continue reading their work. Yeah. Well, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. Thanks for having me on. So it goes without saying that Night Visitor 
is not your first book, right? In fact, this is your 20th, I think. Um, depending on how you count. <laughs> so if you count like fantasy books and the books that I co-wrote with my husband and the books I've written under other names, it is my 21st. I finally oh. decided why not count all those other books? So that's absolutely, that's absolutely. They all to. took blood, sweat and tears, didn't they? Yeah. And not to mention 20 books, but you also have 16 different translations across those multiple genres as well. Mm -hmm. what does that feel like <laughs> it's good it's you know when I look back on them all it's it's um I just feel really grateful that I've been able to just keep writing as much as I have um but you know every book is is a new book yeah. and you know writing each one is its own journey and uh when it goes out in the world it's it's its own journey it always I I always feel like I'm new at it well, within the first few lines of Night Visitor, I mean, it's obvious that you are a fantastic writer. But what else do you think readers find so appealing about your stories? I guess what I'm trying to convey is, first of all, the the connection to the characters that there's uh, that these characters will be people that they'll they'll connect with and at least be interested in finding out where they're going next, even if they're not quite sure about whether there are people they would like to invite into their homes or not. Mm -hmm. um, and then I guess a sense of atmosphere is another thing that I'm always conscious of. I find place and atmosphere really important when I'm reading. And so I like to evoke a certain mood with the, the weather, the time of day, the places that we are. And I guess a little sense of suspense. What's going to happen next? Mm -hmm. I would also add a bit of intrigue as well. All those scenes come together mm -hmm. and it really just drives the story and pushes you forward and builds up that intensity and suspense. Mm. Wondering what happens next is what drives us in our lives as well as in our reading. So I'm happy if I can find that on Absolutely. the page. Absolutely. Absolutely. And speaking of Night Visitor, was mm -hmm. there a triggering moment in your life, either personal or otherwise, that inspired you to create this particular story? There was actually this story has uh, this novel has a very particular origin story. Um, they all have some origin story, but this one I know exactly what it was. In fact, I had uh, it was the fall of 2016, and a student came to me. I teach um, writing and literature at uh, SUNY New Paltz. A student came to me and asked for an extension. And now that happens rather often that students come and ask for an extension on a paper. But this student's reason was. Um, she explained that she had left an abusive marriage. She was trying to make do with two children and having a hard time. So first of all, of course, I gave her the extension. And then I felt like, you know, I didn't know what el how else to help her. So I went around asking uh, my colleagues what resources were available for this woman. And I was told about a place called Family of Woodstock, which is a crisis hotline that also runs uh, homeless shelters and a domestic violence shelter and offers help to um, all sorts of vulnerable people. So um, I went back to my student and someone else had already told her about it, which I was, I was glad to find out. And she said it was great. They'd helped her get a job. She was getting counseling. Um, she was really enthusiastic and hopeful. So that made me feel great. And I had two thoughts. Very often that happens to me when I hear a story like that is I, I thought I want to write something about that, not about my student per se, not about her life, but a woman fleeing a situation like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that I had had to leave a marriage when my daughter was two. And, you know, so I've always felt some a kinship towards. So I thought I had that thought and thought, you know, the subject's important to me. I am going to write something about this. Then I also thought, well, this I really should volunteer at this place family because I had felt so helpless when I didn't know how to help my student. And this seemed like a place that where I could offer help to people like her. So I said to myself, I'm going to volunteer there someday when I have the time mm -hmm. and I'm not so busy. Right. Um, so in the normal course of life, I don't know when that would have happened. When do we ever feel like we're not busy? But um, a couple weeks after that, there was the 2016 election. And the day after the election, I woke up thinking, you know, I think this is the day I'm going to volunteer for family <laughs> of Woodstock. Um, so I called them up just thinking that I would set things in motion because I knew they had um, 
a training program for the crisis hotline. And the woman on the phone told me, when you call up family, you're basically calling the hotline. So they answer, hello, my name is, this is, this is family of Woodstock. I am, and they usually identify themselves by name. Um, and so I told them, you know, that I'd like to volunteer. And they said, well, yeah, you can just come in someday, uh, fill out the form and talk to somebody. And then she must have, as a trained hotline um, person, noticed my, the tone of my voice because she said, wait, hold on one second. Hmm. And when she came back, she said, what are you doing right now? And I said, mm, sitting here feeling crappy. And she said, would you like to come over and help us with a mailing? And I said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so so I ended up, that's how I spent um, November 9th, November 9th, 2016, um, licking envelopes at family. And I signed up for the crisis hotline. I did the training in February. And in the course of that, I started writing the night visitors pretty much right about then. I wrote about a third of it before I did the training. Mm -hmm. I wrote about two thirds of it before I ever worked as a um, shift. And the book, you know, it's set with a character who works for a hotline like that. I made up an imaginary one. Um, it's quite different from family, but it was certainly my student and working at family are the joint inspirations for writing this book. Well, it's interesting so. how that came together for you. And, you know, and I always say that life pushes you in the direction that it wants you mm -hmm. to go in. But I mean, domestic violence and, and the crisis center, that's a pretty serious place to be. Were you prepared for that? Because, I mean, there's emotional roller coasters for, you know, not only the victims, Absolutely. but, you know, mm -hmm. the people who help them, the social workers as well. Well, fortunately, fam family is such a great place that when they train you to work on the hotline, they address all of those issues. Mm. So I did a 60 hour training and they talk about that. They talk about burnout. They talk about what um, it's like to get these calls. They um, role play the calls. You sit in a big circle and they pass around a plastic phone receiver and the uh, trainers will will play the people who calls you might get mm, um yeah i think the very first time that i took a mock call you know it's an imaginary call the first thing i says could you hold on <laughs> because, <laughs> as they had told us you could always say that yeah um because there's always a person there, a, a more trained person there for you to support you in those calls. So they have a lot of support. They give you training and then they have a support system for you. Usually it's two volunteers are on shift and the head of day who is a trained staff member. So whenever if I get a call that I feel either I don't know the information or I feel it's it's something that um, needs more expertise than I have. I say, um, would you mind holding on for a moment? I put the call on hold and I ask for help. And my experience has been is that there is somebody there. To, they're, they're always there to help me. Having all of these experiences, how are you able to channel all of that emotion and all of those things and translate them to the page? Yeah, well, it was interesting because one of the thing, first things I learned when I started the training is that nothing that I hear on the um, phone or even anything personal in the training I can't ever tell anyone. It's right, all right. completely confidential. So I knew that I would not be writing about the things that I heard. But I did ask the, I asked my trainer at that time, is the information, the procedural information that I learn, is that all right for me to write about and divulge? And he said, yes. So once I knew that, I already had my story. I already had said, Alice and Oren on this bus and I, they were traveling towards a, a place of shelter. Um, working for family helped me to understand the background of the people who would be answering that call. So Maddie is somebody, I know how she's been trained. She immediately goes and breaks all that training. So, <laughs> um, you know, she doesn't follow the protocol. You do not. They told us very clearly, you, you never bring a client home with you. Let's explore the characters a little bit. So okay. we know that Alice and Oren are fleeing a very bad situation. But can you give us a little <laughs> bit more about their backgrounds? Well, OK, so, yeah, we don't entirely know what the relationship is. And as we begin to find out more about them, 
we question whether is Alice Oren's mother. And we, we don't know that for sure. We do know mm. that they um, lived with an abusive man who is Oren's father, Davis. And we know that the way they're behaving, we begin to find out about Alice that she has had, um, she's grown up in foster care herself. We might have recognized that from how she thought about the social workers, um, the morally sanctimonious social workers. I just want to say that that's all Alice's point of view. So mm -hmm. um, as we go forward and as she reacts to Maddie, we. Maddie, the social that, worker. Right. Who is a social worker. We, we realize that Alice has a lot of, um, you know, backstory with social workers and, and not good feelings about this system. So we begin to understand that, you know, she has been through, she is somebody who has been traumatized perhaps for her whole life. And at times she reacts to Orin in ways that are, you know, not always ideal as somebody who has been traumatized herself. She's quick to anger and slow to trust. She's also put herself on the line to help this boy. So there's something in her that is very protective of Oren. Oren is wary as a child who has grown up in an abusive home or with a, with an abusive parent. Um, but he also has all this imagination and enthusiasm. He loves Star Wars. He has these little action figures and plays things out. Um, he loves mythology. He's very smart. You can see that right away. He's reading these these books about the Greek myths um, that he is using to try to understand perhaps his own situation. And then the suggestion, you know, with the fact that he got those tickets for Delphi before Alice said that's where they're going. There's right. something that, you know, something going on with Oren that he has some ability um, that we're, we don't really know what it is quite yet, but he seems to know things before he should know them. Yeah. Yeah. The line that stands out to me is when you said, I believe uh, he's a little too smart or with too much smart mm -hmm. for his age. <laughs> too much smart for, yeah. Which would be true of, you know, any child who has had to deal with abuse. He knows things that a child that age shouldn't know. He has had to deal with situations that are beyond what a kid should have to deal with. And he also has some other kinds of abilities that make mm. him make him smart. Mm. OK, so now we have a better understanding of the dynamic between Alice and Oren. But mm -hmm. thinking of Alice and Maddie, I mean, obviously mm. there are two opposing forces, but is it mm -hmm. accurate to say that maybe they're both affected by similar emotional dark places? Mm. Mm. Yes, I think it would be because Maddie, um, when we meet Maddie, we find, you know, she's living in this big old house where that's kind of falling apart. Um, she works at this hotline. She actually founded this hotline. She has a social work background. And we begin to realize that she too is, has this back history. Um, something bad has happened in her life as well um, that has led her to be very solitary and has led her to really dedicate her life to helping victims of abuse. So what that is, it, the story begins to come out. She had a brother who died. We find out eventually that both her father was a judge. So she was raised by a very strict man who believed very much in justice. But what justice means begins to be a bit of an issue. So the story goes on with, you know, what's justice, what's revenge. So she has, you know, she has all of that background in her own life that she is trying to use that to help people. But sometimes some of that history comes out in ways that aren't ideal. And that's true of, you know, people who dedicate themselves to, to helping other people. They're, mm -hmm. they're just human as well. So they're not right. always going right. to be perfect. They're not always going. And as we saw already, she's, she's already broken protocol. They're not always going to do um, exactly what they're supposed to do. And it's so interesting because a lot of times we do forget that people in those roles are humans too, and they have human emotions. Mm -hmm. You know, they go beyond your interaction with them. And right. I wanted her to be human. I wanted her to be fallible. I wanted her to have her own um, her own edge. I'm, I guess I, I'm interested in um, the effects of trauma and what we what we do to go forward, how we have to relegate that trauma to the side or push it down or you know, how we manage to just keep going on, but then what the ways that trauma comes out later. So getting back to the characters, aside mm -hmm. from Oren, you know who the other interesting character was? 
the snowstorm. Oh, <laughs> the, the weather is a character. Yeah, yeah, was, the uh, all encompassing yet at the same time inhibiting snowstorm out there. Yeah. I really think it helps to further illustrate the dynamic playing between the characters. Mm-hmm. Oh, I like. There's a Lou Reed um, quote: "Situations arise because of the weather." Um, and I've always loved that because we have plans. We think what well, things are going to go one way and the weather is just on a daily basis can do something to, um, to change those plans and affect what happens. And up here in the, I live up here in the Hudson Valley on the other side of the river from the Catskills, but we get some pretty intense snowstorms and over there in the mountains, you can really be isolated by mm-hmm. the, those snowstorms. I also just love snow. I, <laughs> you know, and that's what I was wondering. Was there a conscious decision to put the snowstorm in there or instead of rain or anything else? Or was it something mm-hmm. that the story just demanded? I think once I had them on that bus going into the Catskills, I immediately pictured snow falling. I didn't entirely know right away that there would be this, you know, this immense snowstorm, but I could feel it. It's like from the minute I started writing it, there was like the barometric pressure was dropping and Mm. it was clear that there was going to be, um, I I guess I felt it, the pressure building up between these people. I I could feel that reflected in what was going on outside and that there was going to be this, um, this big snowstorm and that they were going to be trapped and have to deal on their own without outside help of course lots of people do manage to make it to maddie's house they're just not the right people at first (laughs) right um there are people who are are menacing her Mm. well i think it all plays together into a wonderful suspense thriller (laughs) (laughs) kind of moving beyond this as we mentioned before Mm -hmm. you have you know a number of other different books, 20 stories, uh, countless Mm -hmm. characters. How do you get the inspiration to keep creating? I think my um, strongest inspirations usually come from something that difficult that I'm dealing with. I have to say that it's, it's very often something that preys on my mind, something that um, the type of thing that wakes me up in the middle of the night. And so what I do, the way I have learned to cope, is to make a story about them and I make a story that's not about me. I make it, it's about other people, but I am somehow working out the problem. So I am really, um, I think addicted to that, Mm -hmm. to be, to using that as a way of processing what happens in life. And I often wonder people who are not writers or painters, or, you know, I often wonder, well, what do they do (laughs) Mm -hmm. when when things are terrible? Um, I, I keep looking, you know, trying to figure things out and I do it by placing people in difficult situations and watching how they, how they manage to get out of them. And honestly, there are times where I've placed characters in situations and I don't know how they're getting out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And isn't it interesting how this one interaction with your student inspired this entire experience of volunteering and writing Mm -hmm. and and now you've birthed this creation into the world. Mm -hmm. It all was a catalyst of that interaction. Yeah. I mean, it's one reason that I I do love to teach is that I feel that it really, it has that effect. It just, your students teach you so much. Yeah. And did I also hear that you were also donating some of the proceeds of this book to the family of Woodstock? I am. It's it's a small percentage, but it's it's what I can afford. So I've given them um, one percent of the proceeds so far, and I will continue to do that. So um, I wish I could do more, but of course, you know, the more books people buy, mm-hmm. <laughs> the more will go. So yeah, I felt like I felt this this was a very unusual circumstance, and and really feeling that. Um, this place had, you know, given me so much for the book. The book is dedicated to family yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So I felt like I, I, it's the least I could do. Absolutely. I mean, every little bit helps, especially with the important work that they do. 
yeah, they've been great. They've been, um, I was a little afraid when I first, because I, I didn't tell, I had asked that question about whether I could use the procedural material, but I hadn't really told them for a while that I was mm. writing this book. And oh, when so I you didn't know how it was going to play out. <laughs> <laughs> I was a little nervous about that. And so there's an essay, they asked me at, uh, my publisher asked me to write a little essay about how I came to write the book. And it's at the back of the book. It's called Finding Family. And I, when I wrote it, I thought, okay, I'm going to write this and I'm going to just try to explain this is just as I explained it to you earlier. And then I thought, okay, I'm going to then show this essay to um, my coworkers and, you know, let them know I've written this book. And so I wanted them to understand that I had not used any confidential material. So I presented them all. I went upstairs and gave all the, you know, the management. <laughs> I gave them each a copy and I gave my head of day who I work with every Wednesday. You know, I gave them all this little essay and and uh, one of the guys who works upstairs came downstairs, and he's the same man who had told me originally, yes, you can use the procedural. He came downstairs, and he said it made me cry. Mm. Wow. <laughs> and wow. so I was like, oh, is that good? And so they were all like, yes, everything's fine. So I was like, I was very relieved. Wow. What an amazing journey getting to this point, mm. I tell you. What's next for you? Well, um, writing-wise, I, I, um, I've written the book that will be next. And I think we have a final title for it. It's called The Sea of Lost Girls, and it's set in Maine, it's, which is a little bit of a departure for me from, mm. from my upstate settings. So I've written that, I've turned that in, and I'm waiting to do the, the final edits on it, and I've launched on the next book. I just, I, I keep writing. <laughs> I have to always be writing something. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate well, this talk. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for asking such great questions and for sharing the book with your listeners. Where can readers go to learn more about you and your books? Okay, so there's carolgoodman.com. That's my website. Um, that has a copy of the essay for the night visitors. So you can go, also go to my author Facebook page on Facebook. I am on Twitter. I don't really do Instagram, <laughs> although mm. I have an account, but the website will tell you, you know, show you where you can buy the book. You can buy the book at your local independent bookstore or Amazon or Barnes and Noble, any of those places. Okay. And with that, we're going to wrap up another episode. Thanks again to Carol Goodman for speaking with us today. And I've mentioned this before in other episodes, but I'll mention it again. If you find yourself in a situation where you are dealing with abuse, do not keep it to yourself. Reach out to someone and we'll have the number for the National Domestic Violence Hotline in the show notes. If you have a question, a comment for Carol or for me or, you know, an author who you think would be a good fit for the show, let me know. Connect with me on social media. I'm on Facebook, Twitter and YouTube. Or you can also send an email to info at ch1podcast.com. Check out our website at ch1podcast.com, where there you can listen to previous episodes and hopefully find your next favorite author. Subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Overcast, wherever podcasts can be downloaded. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review, but most importantly, tell everyone you know about the show, because that is how we grow. All right. Once again, thanks for listening to this episode. You all stay awesome. Till next time.